Uh -oh. <laughs> a conflicted dog. Hold on. Okay. Type of behavior is not unusual for dogs behind bars. And it's almost as though, I mean, the dog really does want to come over and then is kind of like, no, 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 I'm not sure, go away. And it's almost like he's taking turns with the go away. I mean, that's go away right there. But he's not hitting the bars, he's not, you know, sort of just, I, I'm full out aggressive. He's also curious. And the thing is with dogs like this, sometimes if you get them out of the shelter and you're just walking them outside, they're totally fine. I'm not saying go up to dogs like this and take them out. I'm just saying sometimes those dogs, it's really like a barrier frustration. Yeah. So here we have a dog who is a little bit conflicted, I would say, a little nervous. And you're going to see some licking when I go up to the bars, but look at the dog's teeth while he's doing it. I think I can keep filming and not just come up and say hi, huh? Hi. 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 Look at the teeth. Hi. Look at you. Hi. So, I mean, clearly he's coming up for interaction. Nobody's forcing him. Honey. And, and, and he is licking. But I would say that he's okay. not entirely comfortable. Okay. Okay. So, again, this is another dog who I would say is conflicted. Okay. And it's really tough in a shelter environment also. I mean, the dogs are so stressed from all the sounds and everything going on there too. So let's talk about aggression. And we've already talked about a lot of these things that you see up here, the weight forward, making themselves bigger, right, with the piloerection, the hard stare, direct orientation, meaning they're, they're facing the dog directly, um, obviously lunging. And, you know, we've, we've talked about all of that, but I just want to mention that the hard stare... When you have a dog who is just standing still and hard staring you, you know like that dog in one of those first photos who's just like that, that dog is conserving his energy. I would rather see a dog who's going rah, 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 at me than a dog who's doing that. Because the dog who's going, rah, 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 he's not conserving his energy. He's just like, rah, 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 get away from me, you big scary thing. That dog, he's like, when I go for it, you're going to know. Okay, that, that stock still locked and loaded hard stare, that's a very, very scary thing. Okay, um, I actually wrote a, one of my blogs was called The Threat of Stillness, and that's what it was all about. And a lot of people were like, yeah, that's what scares me the most too. And it should. Um, I want to say also that when the dog is doing this, uh, yeah, again, kind of making himself look bigger and all of that. It's not necessarily that the dog wants to be aggressive. It's that he's just displaying that sort of dominant body language. It doesn't mean he's a dominant dog in every situation. Okay, and we're going to talk about dominance in just a minute. Um, I want to say something also about air snaps, just briefly. Air snaps happen in the context of play all the time, okay? An air snap doesn't mean that a dog is definitely, you know, going to bite you. And some dogs will actually air snap when they're excited, you know, just as part of like an attention-seeking type of thing. And again, people will say that thing about, oh, he would have bit me, you know, if I didn't move my hand. If that dog wanted to bite you, he would have, okay? But, but he's air snapping as a warning instead. So it can be a warning, it can be in play, and it can be excitement as well. Um, Bites, you know, at, at the tail end of this bites are, there's kind of a spectrum and I, some of you are probably familiar, especially the trainer with Ian Dunbar has kind of a rank uh, of, you know, level one bite, level two bite and this and that. But really, I mean, going from air snap, which is really no bite at all, to kind of the, the, the sort of bite where there may be a scratch from the teeth, you know, or, or somebody pulled away and that's why there's a bite or a tear, to a real bite you know, which is usually like a bite and retreat, to where there's multiple bites, to where there's a bite and hold. You know, I'll tell you years ago, um, 
very many years ago when I was training, there was a woman who rescued German shepherds and she would now and then say, can you go out and see you know, this dog that we placed? And I would go. And she had placed this shepherd that she said the person was having trouble with and the dog had some aggression issues. And I am telling you that during that session, the dog who was sitting in front of me very, very calmly put his teeth around my forearm and he was sitting there looking at me, looked right up at me, and just started pressing down harder and harder and harder. That was not a good thing, okay? That was not a good moment um, because that dog wasn't just being reactive, you know? He was being very, very deliberate. And the very deliberate bites and the deliberate aggression is really, really, really dangerous, okay? <laughs> and I know you probably want to know what I did. I'm not saying this is what you should do, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna preface this by saying, do not, I'm not telling you what to do if that ever happens. What I did was I got in his face and I yelled at him. I was like, oh, you know, and I, and I like really did, which could have gone completely and terribly wrong, okay? For whatever reason, that was my instinct at the time. Remember me with the active defense reflex? <laughs> The person who doesn't go away from the trouble, I go towards the trouble. That was just my reflex, and again, not, not necessarily the right thing to do. He backed way the hell off. He went crazy redhead, damn. Okay, so it worked. Um, well, it was at the time, but not necessarily in every situation. I would never tell you that. So uh, remember, too, that some breeds are going to be louder in their signaling and clearer in their signaling you know, than other breeds, especially you know, with aggression. So I wanted to show you first this. This is not an aggressive air snap. Okay, so there's a little bit of snapping going on. There's some clack and jaw action there, but anybody scared of this dog? <laughs> I'm not worried about him. He's just an excited lab, right? He's just like, are we going for a walk? Okay, this next video is courtesy of Peggy Kennedy, and this is a 12-year-old pit bull named Duval. And, who, and Duval, I want to tell you, is not being aggressive here, but he is trying to correct Rue, who is a three-year-old pit bull mix, and Rue thinks that Duval wants to play with her. <laughs> he doesn't. Okay. There's a lot of that going on on these videos. <coughs> and by the way, their mom is standing there with the camera, <coughs> and he's actually barking more at the mom, like, hey, come on, do something. <laughs> the puppy has like no <laughs> clue. The puppy needs a secret decoder ring. It means leave me alone. <laughs> okay, again, we have a theme going here, right? Clueless puppies who don't get that the older dog wants to be actually left alone. I really hate when people have really, really old dogs who are not in great health especially, and they bring home a puppy, and the puppy's like all over the old dog, and it, it's kind of like, I don't know, if you were like 90 years old and somebody said, here's a 13-year-old boy, he's gonna come and live with you. Who wants that, right? So, <laughs> yeah, no, who wants it at 50? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, and I wanna say that, just following up on that, that Peggy, who, who gave us that video, said, uh, he, that Duval was actually trying to get her attention, and she said this happens just about every evening after he's been walked and fed, and he wants attention from her, but he really doesn't want to play. So the same thing goes on every night. Okay, this next one, next video is courtesy of Ashley Benson. This is a dog named Shelby who is going to be guarding a uh, patella kind of chew. They got, they got Shelby at the, from a rescue at the age of three, and the dog had been bounced around and not really well socialized. Has come a very long way, and I'm just telling you this before you see this, okay? Because what you're going to see here is the dog is on the bed with the patella, and the boyfriend is going up to approach the dog, and she kind of set this up to get this video, okay? But just so you know, they, they don't normally do this. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha 
That really should have been enough right there. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm worried for this guy, and I'm not, I don't even know him. And the, the helpful husky is like, do you want some help? <laughs> yeah, that husky has no sense. <laughs> He's just kind of like, don't get involved, stay back. Yeah, um, the boyfriend can tell Shelby from a distance to leave it or, or get you know Shelby off of the bed. So again, they just set that up for the video. But again, I think that's actually a dog who has very good signals. I mean, the dog's giving him very good warning. There's no bite. It, it sounds bad. It's a lot of growling, and it's a, like a lunge and a snap. But again, there was no contact. There, were, there was no anything, no damage. Now, this next one is from a trainer named Patrick Danforth, whose business is called Click to Zen. And you're going to see um, two segments of a temperament test. And you will see a raised lip on the first part and an air snap on the second part. There is a third part, which is a training session, where you will see something else happen. Okay, and that is the assess a hand. Hey! <laughs> You're okay! So the dog's a little tense here, a little resource guarding. air snap without contact. And here, when he goes to sort of scritch the dog on the butt, dog completely turns on. <laughs> okay. And Patrick, by the way, mentioned that he's done that with this dog many times before, and the dog never actually reacted that way. If you notice, there was another person uh, sitting over there who is not normally present during this, and that might have been the difference and, and, and you know, made the dog a little nervous, and that's maybe what set the dog off where it wouldn't have normally done that. So, and, and what Patrick did when that dog sort of you know, unexpectedly came after him, I thought was really good. Because instead of saying, hey, what are you doing? You know, don't do that. He was like, hey, you know, let's, he just kind of made, made the whole mood lighter. And sometimes when a dog is really potentially going to become aggressive and you totally switch that mood and make it lighter and different, you can really sm switch the mode of the dog. I had an incident where I was training years ago and a, um, it was like a large German Shepherd and I was, this is back in the day when I would sit in somebody's living room, like in their sort of deep plush chair with arms, which I would never do now. I mean, make sure if you're training, you're like on a hard back chair that you can get up out of really fast if you have to. But you're <laughs> learning, yeah. So uh, it was a learning experience. So I was in this chair and this dog who had known aggression issues, okay? They, they knew there were issues. The dog actually, at some point, he was supposed to be on leash and he wasn't. Uh, they had dropped the leash or whatever had happened. And the dog came up and, <laughs> again, very deliberately, sort of climbed up. So there's me on the chair and I'm, I'm the dog now. He sort of just climbed up and put one paw here and one paw here and like leaned into my face and just went and I'm like sitting there in the chair, right? And I can't get up. And I actually, I don't remember what the dog's name was. Let's call him Beelzebub. Um, like, I said, I said, Beelzebub, sit. Because I knew he had been really, really well trained. And that, for whatever reason, it just switched his mind immediately from being in that mode of I may hurt you to, oh, we're doing that now. Because he was so conditioned that when he heard that, he would sit. So sometimes if you're in a spot like that, you can either do what Patrick did and just kind of, oh, just lighten things up or maybe get the dog to do some sort of obedience. Just things that are good to remember. Okay, so um, I mentioned the assess a hand that was in, and that's Sue Sternberg who, who invented that. And hallelujah, because you know what? Using your own arm is like ill-advised. And so <laughs> we're gonna see a, a dog who has very, very good warning signals and good control of his mouth. <laughs> Oh, that's my dish. That's enough. <coughs> There's no 
contact being made with that hand. It's just air snapping. It sounds horrendously scary though, doesn't it? Especially in slow motion. Yeah, he says, as a matter of fact, that dish is mine. Okay, we're gonna see another one like that where there is less of a warning, and I apologize, this one, the video quality is a little crappy. Oh, Lulu, you are such a silly girl, come on, me, how many? Yeah, so you got one growl and then wham. Okay, this is why there is an assessor hand, by the way, in case you were wondering, and in case you're still wondering why there's an assessor hand. Freeze. Deadly, did we all stop breathing for a minute? <laughs> yeah, you do not want that to be your hand. <laughs> okay, unless you think it's only big dogs doing this. <laughs> Remember the agonistic pucker with the little tongue flicks? Yeah. And that was most definitely contact as well. <laughs> Caught in the act. Yeah. So what all of this had in common, actually, was that the dogs did give a little bit of a warning. Sometimes it was a very little bit, right? But there was a growl. And unfortunately, people don't heed that a lot of the time, or they think, I'm going to teach the dog that this is mine and who's the boss, which is ridiculous. I mean, people actually create resource guarding problems all the time, where there wasn't even one to begin with. They'll do things like say, okay, well, I've got to show this dog that I am the boss and I'm going to be able to take his food away. And so what does the dog learn? That every time you come near his stuff, he may lose it. So he better start guarding it, right? Dogs who have no resource guarding problems, you can create one, unfortunately. Now, remember the two golden retrievers, the one with the snarly, agonistic face, right? That was um, Recon and Zena was the other one. And this is Recon um, giving Zena some muzzle corrections. And Melissa Ellis says, I don't remember the circumstances, but it appears they had been playing for some time and Recon wanted her to stop playing. You see a theme with these dogs, right? Um, and, and both of these dogs, by the way, are out of field, field trial lines and they're bred to work. And Zaina had not yet learned how to flip the off switch. She is getting better though, she says. And this is still in the context of play. like stay down. It's like clueless puppy syndrome. <laughs> Any comments or questions on this one? Yeah, I think we all know pretty much what was going on here. You can kind of see the relationship between those two dogs. Um, and, and I will say that these kind of like muzzle corrections are used a lot between dogs in the context of play and it's not necessarily aggression, you know. Now, um, I'm going to sh go into people and dogs because I, I really think that this is a hugely important part of it. And what happens f to break down the communication between us, okay? A lot of things can happen actually, but not paying attention. <laughs> the dog park, for example. Have you seen people come in with the latte in one hand and the newspaper in the other? <laughs> Okay, you can't possibly be paying attention to your dog while you're doing that or while you're checking your email or anything else, okay? The best tool you have in a group play situation of any kind is your attention and monitoring the dog. So 
Sometimes we are not noticing that play is escalating, for example, or that dogs are ganging up or bullying or, you know, whatever's going on. Um, sometimes people are kind of indifferent. You know, they're kind of like, ah, eh, the dogs just kind of need to work it out. Sometimes it's their belief system. Sometimes it's a cultural thing, you know, where we're just not really used to looking at dogs that way. Sometimes it's a misunderstanding altogether. Um, there is a huge lack of education out there, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, but there's a huge lack of education out there, I think, for the general public as far as how dogs should be interacting with each other, especially in park situations, and what can be dangerous, you know? Um, and unfortunately, you know, it's kind of crazy to me because we have early education for so many different things in the school, but nothing about how to interact with dogs or pets. And they're parts of so many households in the country. It's, it's nuts. There should be at least some kind of program that comes in. Um, and sometimes it's just disrespectful. You know, there are people that, and you've probably seen these things on like YouTube, where people are kind of like taunting the dogs because they think it's kind of funny to get a certain reaction out of the dog. So um, I'm going to show you a couple of videos here where the dogs are not exactly finding things rewarding. <laughs> If you've seen my full day on fear issues, you've seen this clip. This is Simba in his group class. And the woman who adopted him, who's very nice. You know what, if that's his form of affection for me, so be it. No, I didn't reward these guys. Was that rewarding to that dog, petting him that way? Big rewards. He's learning that when he does what she says, this is what happens. But I'm like the only one that can but he's better than he was. He's tolerating it. Maybe we could do basically. Oh, yeah, me. And now it's it's a complete duck and move away in addition. So and she has been told that, you know, this is not rewarding to the dog and I think she just sort of can't help it. But uh, yeah, so, so that is not something that that dog is finding rewarding. Here is something that many dogs don't find rewarding. Okay, and, and I just want to put out there that this um, particular video was courtesy of Colleen Pilar, who, who is a professional trainer, and just set this up as, as a favor. She does not normally have her, her kids doing that. And again, Rebecca Can, who um, has her daughter hugging the dog. These kids are really cute. <laughs> the dog is like, I am a long-suffering, tolerant dog. I don't love this, but I know it makes you happy. Okay, And that's really exactly what that dog is saying. Now, remember I was talking about how some people kind of tease their dogs into doing things? Here is a gentleman with his chihuahua. He loves this dog, by the way. <laughs> The dog's not biting him. Is the dog happy? He's getting less happy. Okay, you can go. You can go. Yeah, um, and, and the dog had a bone there, so that may be part of why when he was kissing the dog on the head there was that growling going on. There are many people who think it's kind of funny to tease dogs that way. Frankly, I was waiting that the dog was going to bite him in the face the way that the dog was growling like that. And again, that dog was being very, very tolerant. That dog was not being aggressive. I mean, I really want to put a, a label on that. That was not aggression. That was a dog warning, saying, listen, I am not comfortable with what you're doing. Please back off. Okay? So when we talk to dogs, how many... Ah. Whoop, hold on. When we talk to... Ah, there's too many videos. Stop. Okay, when we talk to dogs, do the words that we use really matter when we train them? A lot of people think they do. Right? A lot of people say, well, what's the right word to use, you know, for, for this particular behavior? I don't care if you say spatula, you know, for like lay down or whatever. It's whatever you teach the dog. And some people actually train their dogs in other languages. Schutzen dogs are very often trained in German. 
Um, and so I'm going to show you a, a video of actually Monty Sloan at Wolf Park, my long-suffering friend who did this for me. And he is training his German Shepherd. And I would be curious to know, and if any of you know the answer to this, you're not allowed to say it. If, if any of you can tell me what language this is. Okay. Anybody have an idea? Uh, sign language, yeah. Anybody else? Okay, so I'm going to let Monty tell you actually. Ba means sit. Kot means down. Kikosh means come. Uh, los means stay. Simple as that. Very simple. How to train your dog in Klingon. Blaka. <laughs> Klingon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, would have been right. <laughs> But as somebody over here mentioned, I think that that dog was going very much off of his, his sign language, his, his body language, as well as whatever he's trained him to. I don't know Klingon, so. Um, but you could see as when he was saying what, whatever that word was to get the dog up after he was laying down, he kind of walked into him also. You know, and there was obviously, you know, sit and lay down and there, and there was a lot of body language going on as well. Um, here is a game that is very popular in group classes, and this is called Fruits and Vegetables. I don't know if any of you have ever played this. I could be saying, you silly little dog, I'm taking you to the pound, I don't like you. And he's going, okay, let's go. Okay, as long as you use the right tone of voice. All right. Let's play fruits. One group is only going to be able to say the name of fruits. One group is only going to be able to say the name of vegetables. And you're supposed to get your dog really happy and excited. And you can only use those words. is like, this is so silly, I feel dumb, I'm not doing this. You're not supposed to give him treats or touch him, by the way. What's interesting to me is that even though she said, don't give him treats and don't touch him, nobody could really help it. I did love the woman who's like, broccoli, potatoes. You know? But it does, it really goes to show you, it doesn't matter what the words are, right? This is just, you know, the dog is going off of basically the tone of your voice, right? So words really do not matter. And again, you know, they're responding to the verbal cues. Why? Because we've paired them with something that we've taught the dog already. You can teach a dog a behavior and then call it anything you want. Right? That's why we can do such cute tricks with dogs. So um, it's kind of funny, I've always thought about when people say, wow, you know, I can't get my dog to come to me. And if I yell, come, my dog won't come running. Oh, but if I yell, cookie, he'll come running. Because you've conditioned him every single time that dog has ever heard the word cookie, you gave him one. What if every time you ever called him, you said, come, you gave him a cookie? Oh my gosh. He would be coming to you when you said, come, right? Cookie's not a magic word, po contrary to popular belief. You know, and uh, people will say, oh, well, how did you train the dog to do such and such? There are certain things that dogs learn kind of through osmosis and repetition. For example, when I take my dogs out um, to, to or from the park, I have the windows rolled down a little bit, but when I get there, I want the windows rolled up. However, sometimes they have other ideas, right? They're like trying to stick their heads out the window and I don't want to catch their nose. So I'll say, you know, watch your head. 
and they will back right off, right? And I roll the window up. How did they learn that? Because I said, watch your head, and I rolled the window up. I don't mean with their heads in there, okay? Yeah, that would be one trial learning. No. So, so again, it's just a matter of repeating. This happens, and then this happens, and obviously they learn. So um, I do think that you have to be careful in certain circumstances with what you say, though. For example, if you have a dog who's really fearful, and whenever something is coming that he's worried about, you say to him, it's okay, don't worry, it's okay. Wh what is that word going to come to be associated with? Oh, it means something big and scary is going to happen. So be careful about things like that. You know? And I do think there should be one verbal cue for one thing, and it shouldn't mean five different things. You know, get down should not mean get down off of me, get down off of the couch, get down, right? I mean, it shouldn't mean like five different things. It should be, you know, because one day the dog's going to be on the couch and you're going to say get down and he's going to like lay down. You said down, right? So, um, and remember we were talking about high-pitched sounds. High-pitched sounds actually encourage movement. Even breeders who like don't know anything about dog behavior, when they have puppies and they want them to follow them, they'll say pop, 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 pop. Right? And the puppies follow them because it's high-pitched and it re it's repetitive, and that engenders movement. With the low-pitched sort of one-syllable sounds, that gets animals to stop. Now, I'm not a horse person, but I understand you have this whoa word. <laughs> then, yeah, it's like, whoa. It's not like, whoa, 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 right? You, you want the animal to stop. And if I wanted a dog to stop running, I wouldn't say, wait, 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 which actually is what a lot of people do. I would say, wait, right? One syllable low. Okay. Now, sometimes people will say things like, go see so-and-so, you know, go see Bob. Yeah, go see Bob. Bob's over there. Go see Bob. Okay, you, when you're doing that, you're the most exciting thing in the room. The dog is never going to go see Bob, who's just standing there like the nice guy that he is going, oh, I don't know why the dog's not coming to me. She's telling him to come see me. She's being too exciting. Okay, so sometimes people don't really quite understand why. Um, how you use your voice can obviously have a huge effect on how your training goes. I actually, you know, as trainers, we teach people to use a high happy voice, you know, to recall their dogs to them. I actually had a client who I kept trying to get her to use the high happy voice, and she would be like, and this is a woman, okay, and, and she was like, come, you know, Fido, come. And I finally, one day we were chatting, and I asked her, you know, what do you do for a living? She was a drill sergeant. And there was probably no way that she was actually going to be going, Fido, come! You know, just not going to happen. So we had to train him to come to that voice, you know? Yeah. Ah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you know, that's a great question, actually. So, so her question is basically that when you are getting a dog to come to you, um, usually, you know, we hear that you should give the, a cue once, right? Sit, down, come, stay, whatever it is. But if I'm saying high-pitched sort of repetitive noises get a dog to come to you, would it not be okay to say, you know, come and then, you know, or whatever? Well, for a puppy, definitely. I mean, absolutely. That's how we would start it, maybe. But also, um, even for... Listen, with my adult dogs, I practice recalls off-leash, like in a, in a big enclosed park, right, when there's nobody else there. And when they start coming to me, I, and I always use their name first because I want their attention before I actually call them to me. Because if I don't have their attention, chances are they are not going to come to me. So I, I call their name, they look at me, and then I, you know, Sierra, come. And then once she's coming to me, I don't want her veering off. Like, Yes, 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 squirrel, you know? So I, I will actually say, good girl coming to me, come on, let's go, you know? And yeah, that absolutely encourages her to keep coming. That, yeah, good point. Um, I'm going to show you a video, and this is... Oh, actually, before we, before we do that, let me just briefly talk about this. Uh, the three Cs. So consistency basically means that like down shouldn't mean five different things. Everybody in the family, of course, needs to be consistent with that as well. Clarity, don't garble your, your, um, your cues with a lot of other language. You know what I mean? I asked you to sit. Come on, you know you're supposed to sit. The dog's crying, wah, 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 wah. Sit, wah, wah. You know, they, they just don't know. So, so try and keep it as clear as you can. You know, I think a good um, exercise for people who sort of talk a lot to their dogs 
take your dog on a walk and don't say anything to him, except if you really need to get his attention to go a different way or if you want him to sit or whatever. But don't say anything else to him. And I'm telling you, within a couple days of doing that, your dog will be paying a lot more attention to you. If you just talk all the time, it's like kids. They learn to tune you out. Okay? And, and also, for God's sake, don't say the word louder if the dog didn't do it the first time. You all know a dog can hear a potato chip hit the carpet in the next room, right? The dog heard you say the word the first time. You don't need to repeat it louder. Um, I also hate when people verbally correct their dogs and their dogs stop doing the thing and then they just keep going. There was a woman at the park who's, she had a Sheltie, two Shelties, and one of them had gotten into something. I, I couldn't tell what it was. I was uh, at a distance. But the dog was in something. And she was like, you know, leave it, leave it. And so the dog did. The dog left it alone. And for five minutes, well, why did you have to do that? Why did you go over there? And I'm like, that poor dog left it five minutes ago. Stop yelling at him. You know, just like your praise should be well-timed. If you're going to give a verbal correction, give it. And it's done. You know? Context. Um, Ian Dunbar has a great thing called the sit tests, which some of you are probably familiar with. And it's all about, it's showing you how a dog is learning certain things in context. So in other words, he'll start out saying, how many of you have dogs who know the word sit? And of course, everybody's like, of course we do, you know. And then he'll say, well, how many of you have dogs that will, or he'll have you actually try it, um, dogs who will sit if you are in back of them instead of in front of them because it changes the dog's perspective, right? Changes the context. What about if you were in the next room? What about if you were laying down? Well, you know, and, and the thing is, it, it really does prove a good point. A lot of times when um, people are walking dogs and they want them to walk nicely with them and when they stop, they want the dog to sit, what happens with a lot of dogs is they swing out in front. Why? Because you've taught them that that's what sit means, Right? A uh, good trick for that, by the way, is find a wall and, and make it a really narrow space between you and the wall and, and stop, and the dog's not going to be able to swing out, and they'll start getting that muscle memory, and they'll straighten out. So, so the context um, needs to be kind of generalized with your help. Okay, so we are going to, we're going to play a really quick game. And what we're going to do for this game is you guys are actually going to pair up you don't have to get up out of your seats or anything else, but pair up with somebody, and here's what we're going to do. All right. You see all of these sort of um, emotions or ways of saying things? All you're going to be able to say is your dog's name. This is going to be a really quick exercise, okay? And I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. I'm, let's say I use Bodhi as an example, okay? Happy love. Bodhi. Okay? Cure command. Bodhi. Disgusted. That's easy. Uh, disgusted. Bodhi. Sharp. Bodhi. Attention getting. Bodhi. Warning. Bodhi. Okay, we, we're all on the same page about what those are. Okay, so all I want you to do just for this first one, and it's going to be real quick, each, and if you don't have a dog at the moment, you can use your old dog's name or make up a name. I don't really care. It doesn't matter. Use the name of your child. Um, so, so let's pair up. You don't have to get up. You can, you can, and tell me if anybody does not have a partner. Anybody not have a partner? There's, there's a method to my madness. You'll want to do this. I'm telling you why. I will tell you after you do this. Okay? Take, take a minute. And after one person does it, the other person can go. Come on, guys. Yeah, you're you're going to tell each other. Yes, come on. Okay, so you're going to go down each one of these. And when each one of you, when you are both done, raise your hands. Okay, we're not chatting, we're just doing the exercise. And when you have both had a chance to do it, raise your hands so I know you're done. Okay, I'm going to give you another minute. We have a few more. Okay, so now, here's the second part of it. You guys all did very well. Okay, watch. <laughs> okay, so now, you guys are done, thank you. So, 
Okay, now the second part of it. I want you to do the same thing, but this time when you do it, don't just use your voice. This time I really want you to use your facial expression. Not necessarily your body language, but really use your facial expression and put emotion into this. Okay, Kathy, this will be like one of your acting exercises. <laughs> okay, go for it. And when you've both had a chance to do all of them again, just raise your hands and let me know. You guys are done. You guys are done. You guys are done. Again, we're not chatting. We're just doing the exercise. Come back. And are you guys done? Have you? Yeah? OK. I'm going to assume that you all had a chance to do the second round. Okay, so I would like you guys to tell me, was there a difference between the first round and the second round? For those of you who really did this, how was it different? Who said it's harder? What was harder? <coughs> Sorry? Okay, it was harder for you to make a, uh, consciously make a facial expression for each. Okay, how about the people who were watching the people make the facial expressions? How did it seem different to you? It was easier to understand. Yeah, I agree. More connection. Yeah. Okay, so you feel the emotion coming from them more. Or when you were making the facial expressions. So these are all really great points, right? <coughs> Excuse me. When you were actually making the facial expressions, did you, did you guys agree? Do you, did you feel it more? Okay. And when you were the ones getting the facial expressions, it was. It was clearer, right? The intent of the person was clearer. Dogs read our facial expressions all the time. This is what they have to go off of. And if you are just saying, sit, down, come, you know, good dog, you're shortchanging yourself because you have a really valuable tool and you could be doing so much more with your dog. Your communication could be so much clearer. So I really urge you, just do, as it, do it as an experiment. When you get home, just start doing that more consciously when you interact with your dog and see if you get any different response. Okay. Any other um, questions or comments on that? Okay, great. So, wow, it's really coming down again. Um, when we talk about human body language versus um, verbal, when we talk to dogs, we all have established that the dogs look at, the, look at our body language, right, more than they really listen to what we're saying. And Patricia McConnell, who you guys know, those of you who are trainers, and for those of you who don't know, she's a really uh, amazing animal behaviorist. And she had two undergrad students who took six and a half week old puppies of different breeds. There were four each of uh, beagles, cavaliers, border collies, Australian shepherds, mini schnauzers, and Dalmatians. And she taught them, the undergrad students taught them to sit to both a, a sound and a cue, a visual cue. And the sound was a little beep. It was like a handheld uh, watch kind of beeper. And they simultaneously did this for sit and presented the beep at the same time. Okay, so the dogs learned both at the same time. And then for the trial, they, they um, did four days of training on both together. And on the fifth day, the trainer presented one or the other. Okay, just randomly. Either the beep by itself or the hand signal by itself. 23 of the 24 puppies involved in the study performed better to the hand motion than to the sound, okay? And interestingly, breed differences here, the Border Collies and Aussies, who are kind of like the overachievers of the dog world, uh, they got 37 out of 40 right on the hand signals and only six right out of 40 on the beep, 
Okay. The Dalmatians sat 16 out of 20 uh, times for the visual signals, but only four times on the beeps. The Cavaliers got 18 out of 20 right on the visual and 10 out of 20 on the acoustic. And the Beagles and the Mini Schnauzers set 32 out of 40 times to the visual signal and zero times out of 40 to the beep. So if you have a Beagle or a Mini Schnauzer and you were banging your head against the wall trying to teach that dog on verbal cues alone, I would stop and reconsider. <laughs> okay? So again, it's just really, it is so much easier to teach a verbal cue first and then put your, te teach a visual cue first and then put your verbal cue on top of it. Say the verbal cue and then do the hand signal once the dog already knows the hand signal. Okay? Interestingly, dogs also respond to where we are looking. There have been a lot of studies on this lately, but way back in the 60s, there was a guy, have any of you ever heard of a guy named Chuck Eisenman? Th this was in the 60s, and he did these kind of like little dog and pony shows, you know, where he would do tricks for people with the dogs. And he um, was a, a dog trainer, and he did film and TV. He trained using what he called the intellectual method. And here's what he really did. Instead of associating one word with an action, he would tell his dogs to do things. And instead of saying like, okay, you know, go over it, Sparky, sit, he would say, Sparky, would you kindly, pla kindly place your derriere on the ground for me? And people were like, what? How did he do that? He would also say things like, find something in this room that's the color red. And all of us, if we could see a dog doing that, we'd be pretty impressed, wouldn't we? Right? Or he'd say, S find some words printed on paper. And people were absolutely amazed. This is back in the 60s. And here's what it was. Basically, he found out, and it was just a very conversational tone when he said it, so it was really impressive. And it turns out that what Eisenman would do, he would actually look towards the object very subtly that he wanted the dog to go to, and the dog would look where he was looking, and the dog would go to that object, and then he had a very limited repertoire of things that he could do when he was there either put his nose on it or paw on it or whatever it was. So we don't really need studies to tell us that dogs can look and, and see where we're looking. Um, dogs can actually follow when you're pointing. I can tell you for sure, it's funny because a new study came out that they were like, oh, dogs can follow points. Dogs, right? That's what I said. I was like, yeah, duh. You know, I mean, why don't you just, instead of spending all those thousands of dollars, ask a couple of dog owners, right? But I mean, it's good. It's good that there's science behind it. I'm kidding. But, but I will tell you that Bodhi, you know, if I drop something on the floor and I do this, he knows. He knows what that tapping toe means. It means, look, that's where the food is. Go get it. Right? That was probably one trial learning with him. He's so food motivated. So, um, so frontal versus sideways presentations. You know, if you've been at my fear seminars, I, I sort of harp on this, that obviously you're scarier to a dog when you're standing this way than when you're kind of turned this way, right? Um, and yet, we not only greet dogs like this, but we lean forward over them. We put our hands out. I mean, what does that look like to a dog? For, ugh, you know, there's this hand coming at me. A and usually, we're coming straight at them rather than arcing in a nice, polite kind of way. Spatial issues. Um, dogs have a real understanding of the space around them and when it is encroached on and when other, you know, dogs and other people have space around them. Bodhi is a very pushy, pushy dog, and when we first got him out of the shelter, he was horrible. He w you could not walk one step without him jumping on you and mouthing you really hard all up and down the arms and the legs, and he would really get in your space all the time. And I'm not a fan of pushing dogs because this is like a great game for a lot of dogs, but I will use my lower body to actually kind of push and encroach on their space. And you saw in the video of Monty where he was doing the training w with the German Shepherd in Klingon, um, how when the dog was laying down, he just kind of walked into its space to make it get up again, to make it sit up. So it's all about who's kind of taking that space, and dogs really get that. Um, with gestures, I want to say a lot of us gesture a lot when we talk, and you have to really be careful with that around dogs. You know, same thing around working with wolves. You don't want to be doing a lot of this. Um, I'm going to show you a video, a very brief video, of a man who is training his wolf dog, and I want you to tell me why he's having a little bit of trouble getting this dog to lie down. Thank <laughs> you. 
came up so fast your bus came up. Why was there a problem? He was backing up? Is that why you think? Yeah? Okay, definitely part of it. Why else? Sorry? Standing right in front. I think that's okay, standing in front of him. I'm sorry. He treated the dog and praised the dog when he sat up. That was definitely a problem. And I want to say that he had a treat in his hand. And a, lot of, and a lot of people do this. They're gesturing to the dog, like, lay down, do this. And the dog is just looking at the treat in your hand. He's not going to ever lay down. He wants to follow the treat, right? So, again, we think that we're being really clear in our, what we're doing, but we don't really realize that the dog is seeing it a whole different way. Here's a woman who wants a dog to go someplace, and why isn't the dog going? go right so yeah the dog is going wow this is a great game what's that let's follow that it's a puppy yeah Woo. so again with gesturing sometimes not what we're thinking okay it's not the same thing um i am gonna just actually let's see i'm gonna show you a training demo which is at a local dog park from me and you're going to see, well, you can tell me what you see afterwards, but all I want to say is I do not think that the dog being trained is getting a lot of advance warning before it gets corrected, okay? I don't think the dog's be being given enough of a sort of uh, window of opportunity to follow a cue. Whoops, sorry. Whoops. Right turn. Keep right turn. Right turn. Stay. Leave him. Turn around, down him. Walk to the left. Walk to your right. To the right. Praise. Forward, heel. Talk to him. Left turn. Left turn. Stay down. We call to a sit. Thank you. When we first start. Watch the, when the verbal cue is given and when this correction is getting given. And is the dog having a chance to actually do the behavior before it gets corrected? Stress shake off. Okay, so this is sort of very old, um, old style traditional training, a lot of that kind of square block healing as it's called. And so what did you guys notice with this dog? Yeah, 
Yeah, the dog was very disconnected. There was no sort of happy, what are we doing next kind of thing going on. Totally disconnected from the owner. Yes, exactly. And, and if you couldn't hear, she said that it's almost like the, the corrections that were being given were the actual cue for the dog to do something. So like when he said, you know, and sit up from a down position, it was like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. The dog really never had a chance to respond to a verbal cue without being corrected first. Yeah. That's right. Yes, just to clarify. Thank you. The, the man's voice that you heard was actually instructing the handler on what to do with the dog. He wasn't cueing the dog. The handler was cueing the dog. That's true, and I, and I do not believe she was actually giving any verbal cues. I believe her cues were, as you said, were, were actually the, the pop on the leash, okay? So um, again, if, you know, it would be like if I was going to take you on a walk, and you, we were just like arm in arm, and I was going to take off in a certain direction, but I didn't tell you at all, and I just went, okay, you'd be yanked, right? You'd be c pulling with me. If I said to you, hey, I'm going to, let's go over there, turn right, you know, we'd be going right. With my dogs, I mean, honestly, you know, the idea is always to have a loose leash when they're on leash. And believe me, they get distracted and everything else. But if I want to go that way, you know, I, I'm not jerking them and saying, you know, go over here. I, I actually, I just go, and that's it. <coughs> and they look at me and, and, you know, and we go over there. It's all about getting the dog's attention first. Okay. I'm going to show you a... Um, Actually, I just want to talk very briefly about dominance. <coughs> dominance, the D word. It has become sort of a very charged term as of late. And I want to just make the distinction that dominance is not the same as status. Okay? And, and I'm going to give you a second to think about that. If you have a specific situation with two dogs and one of them is being dominant over the other in that situation which that is legitimate you know hey it's my bone or whatever it is that does not mean that that dog is a dominant dog in general okay he may behave one way with one dog and a completely different way with another dog it's situation specific and even within the same group of dogs you may find you know one has access to this resource first one eats first. I mean, it, it just really, really dep it depends a lot on what's important to the dogs. But within a set group, yeah, you do have a certain kind of rank, but it's, f it's flowing. It's not like you're the boss of everything in life. You know, if you, have, if you worked in an office and you had a boss, obviously your boss is the one that has the higher status, right? The higher rank. But in a specific situation with him, you might actually be dominant. No, you know what? I'm actually not going to do that because I have this to do doesn't mean you're suddenly the higher ranking. So again, dominance is, is not, you know, the higher ranking dog. And I want to say that true alphas, you know, we talk a lot like in the wolf world, they, there's a lot of old history with the alpha wolf, you know. Well, it's really more like a family pack, you know, they found that out later on. But the, the, the leaders, let's just say, so we don't have that whole dominance alpha thing, the leaders have nothing to prove. It's kind of like thinking that your parents have to prove to you that they're tough and in charge. Of course they are. You're a little kid, right? So with a wolf pack, the ones who are squabbling and fighting and all that and, and proving how strong they are and how big they are, they're not actually the alphas. They're actually the kind of middle rankers who are squabbling because they're wannabe alphas. You know, if you look even at a group of people, and whoever is in an office, let's say, again, because there's sort of a rank structure there, the people who are sort of very quiet, who people listen to when they open their mouth and speak, those are the people with the true power. The ones that are walking around like, well, I'm going to... Those are not the people with the power. Those are the people who want the power, <laughs> but they have something to prove. A real alpha does not have anything to prove. Okay, and besides, it's not really that kind of structure. Um, interestingly, at Wolf Park, the alpha, the ones that are real bullies when they're alphas, you know, when they're kind of pack leaders, they get deposed very quickly. The other wolves are not having it. 
And so you want to be like a wise, calm leader for your dog. You don't want to be a bully. You don't have to prove that you're in charge because clearly you have the opposable thumbs, right? And you can open the food and you are in charge for lots of reasons. So I really like this quote by Abraham Maslow, which is when the only tool you have is a hammer, you see everything as a nail. And if you look at every situation with a dog as the dog's being dominant, the dog's being dominant. He jumped on me, he's being dominant. He's, he's running out the door, he's being dominant. You know, If you look at it that way, you're going to address it in a certain way. And that's not going to be a way that really solves anything. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to show you um, just a couple of... Are you guys okay for like another couple? Yeah? Okay. I'm, I'm going to show you guys actually a video of a dog named... Actually, I'm going to show you a scuffle at the dog park. And I'm going to show you in real time, and then I'm going to show you in slow motion. And I want you to tell me if you can see things when they start to really escalate and get out of hand. Just say now when you start getting worried. <laughs> Ironically, you all got worried at the same time Sierra got worried. Good girl. She's one of those dogs that splits other dogs up. Don't drop your coffee. That's pretty impressive, one-handed. <laughs> okay. Okay, and here are things right there. Things start to get really escalated really fast. Even in slow motion, they're moving pretty quick. And this woman, by the way, is Nico's mom, the Husky's mom, the woman who comes over. She is not a trainer, but she's got really good handling skills. <laughs> and the one-handed coffee, <laughs> grab your dog, Michael. He actually manages to push the husky off and grab his dog with one hand, which is pretty impressive. And then she grabs Nico, who says, hey, no, she, my mom's got me, don't start. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here is a dog um, that lives, this is a dog named Amelia. This is courtesy of Chelsea Edwards, who's a trainer in Portland. And watch the dog-person interactions here. This is uh, the couple that the dog lives with. And the guy is a little bit more um, old school in his training methods. And so this dog has a little bit of a fear issue around the guy. Don't worry, you're not going to see anything bad happen to the dog. Mom, mom, I think, is the dog's security blanket. Okay, so typical fear reactive behavior towards the guy. Even with the other dogs there, and the other dogs are friendly with this guy, not a problem. Going up on mom's lap. If he hadn't started putting his hand out to that dog and he had just paid attention to the other dogs, that dog probably would have came out. Come here, Amelia. Come on. 
try everything I know with you. Right there, Shelby, come up. Okay, so I'm up here on Mom's lap. I'm happy about that. I know. I know you're so mean. Yes, you are. Oh, I know. I know. Hey, he's gone. Okay, he's gone. You all right now? Really? He's like, no, he's not. Good girl. He's back. Good girl. Good girl. So she's tolerating the petting. She's she's not snapping at him or anything else. Good, great dog. But all of that kind of chuffing stuff. I mean, she's clearly still not comfortable. I'm not trying to force it. And, you know, a lot of people will do that with a dog who is sort of scared of them or a little bit fear reactive towards them. They will try to kind of force the dog to be in one area and, and teach the dog that, like, oh, petting is okay, you know, because we're Can you get down kind now? of forcing you to. And, and it's really not the way to go no. about it. Good. The dog's uh, like, uh, I don't Mandy. want to get down. Amelia, come here. And this is Sit. going to be the result of this dog's stress. You're going to see in just a second here. Okay, so we have some, some sort of scratching related to stress. The dog is not exactly paying attention to the cues. Because she's too aroused and stressed out, right, about what's going on. And now... Okay, I think now the guy is really gone. Ah! ah! No! No! Okay. I don't know for sure, but I'm betting that's where he sits. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, we, we've actually, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to skip this one. And I just want to, I'm going to show you one more video at the end. But I just really, really want to kind of reiterate this stuff. That number one, all of the body signals, and it's, I know it's been a long day of signals and videos and everything else, all of it has to really be taken in context. You can't take one thing that the dog's doing, right? It has to be in context with not only what's happening in the environment, but what's happening with the entire dog's body, not just one part of it. Behavior does not define the dog. If the dog is acting in a dominant way or a submissive way, doesn't mean it's a dominant dog or a submissive dog. It means he's acting that way in that specific scenario. Um, warning signals are good. I think we all agree on that. Growling is actually a good thing, right? Don't punish growling. We've got to be very clear in our own signals, right? Verbally and, and with our body language. And physical force is never, ever necessary. The more you know what you're doing and the better you understand the actual science behind dog training and behavior, the less physical you actually have to get with a dog. Okay? So, um, I'm going to just give you, uh, you have on your slides recommended reading. These are just, um, in addition to everything on that table, of course, but uh, you, you are, uh, th these are just some really good books uh, regarding specifically canine body language and so forth. And I'm going to leave you with a video of, um, this is by courtesy of Sarah Scott. And I have to tell you guys that this actually had different music to it that I replaced because it was a real song and we're not allowed to use real copyrighted stuff. So blame any bad music editing on me. But I think that this is very cute.
impressive. <laughs> I love the crunches. <laughs> my friends, is an example of when you really understand your dog's body language and you really train clearly using yours, what can be accomplished, which I think is actually very awesome. And I want to mention that you can find, you can find, here's, the, here's my commercial, you can find my books, DVDs, blog, article, like pretty much everything, on NicoleWild.com, all in one happy place. And I want to say a big thank you to Canine Country Academy for hosting me here. Thank you very much, Kathy, Bruce, and all of the staff here. And I want to thank you guys for coming. I know it's a long day to sit here and, and look at things, but I really appreciate that you had great, great questions. And I hope that you got some new and different information from it. So thank you very much. Thank you, guys. <laughs>